Dear colleagues, first let me to thank the organizer of the conference for the invitation, for the opportunity to speak here and share the result of my research, to listen to the interesting reports on the theme of the conference and to exchange of views. The purpose of my research to, is to reveal the problem of relationship of the Cossacks and the Third Reich during the World War II and to show the main aspects of the participation of Cossacks in war on the side of Nazi Germany. The problem of collaboration in the countries of Western Europe has already been being widely covered on the basis of great amount of literature both in Russian and foreign historiography. At the same time, and the problem of collaboration in Eastern Europe is only beginning to attract the attention of researchers. Despite numerous publications on this term, there are many unexplored questions. One of them is the cooperation of the Russian Cossacks with the political governance and the armed forces of the Third Reich. In this case, this problem has its own, own special sounding. To the beginning of war, the Cossacks were divided into two parts, citizens of the USSR and Cossack emigrants, many of whom lived in different countries of Europe. Cossack emigrants in the majority supported the campaign of Hitler IMS to the east. Many of them stood for the direct envelopment into war on the German side. However, the leaders of the Third Reich initially reacted negatively to such support. So first lie the emigrants' military units were being created on the initiative of emigrants themselves. The formation on the first military unit of Russian emigrants, separate Russian corps or Russian guard corps, was started in September of 1941 in Belgrade. Within the Russian corps, it was formed the Cossack Regiment. The separate Russian, Russian corps was used by Germans only in the Balkan theater of war, though many emigrants right, were seeking for going to the Eastern Front. The main reasons for that were the aims to overthrow the hated Bolshevik regime and to see their homeland. In autumn of 1941, with the Blitzkrieg, failure and great losses among forces, the commanders of military units of German army began forming the troops consisted of the prisoners of war and sympathizers. Mostly the command of German army and more precisely its difficult position on the front in fact, fact became the main catalyst of taking the official decision of using Cossacks within Wehrmacht and changing the general attitude to the Cossacks. In September 1941, the officer of Army counter Paul Ewald von Kleist, proposed to the command of German 18th Army to use Cossacks for more effective fight against partisans. In October 1941, this initiative was continued in the official permission of the commander of the rear areas to form auxiliary military units, including Cossacks, from the prisoners of war and local population. The first Cossack unit, consisted from prisoners of war, was created in October 1941 in Mogilev with Ivan Kononov, Don Cossack, as its commander. He was the Red Army officer who voluntarily moved to the side of Germans. The successful use of Cossacks on the front on exigency of replenishment personal losses led in April 1942 to the private permission of Hitler to use the Cossack military units. In summer 1942, the center of forming the Cossack troops from Soviet captives became Ukraine, Vinitsa, Slavuta, Shepetovka. About 15 Cossack regiments of amount from 15 to 20,000 were created to spring 1943. The emphasis when creating the Cossack troops from the prisoners of war and sympathizers was made on the using them for security of the strategically important objects, warehouse, railways, bridges, and fight against partisans. The Cossacks, like convinced opponents of the Soviet regime, showed their best side from the German point of view. 
In September 1942, the German forces had occupied the Kuban territory for a number of reasons and first of all for the policy pursued by the Soviet regime in 1920-1960s as Kazachevania, repressions of the Cossacks, a part of the population of the Cossack province has meeting Germans as liberators from the Bolsheviks' Iron Hill. If we compare the level of loyalty to the occupants, we can see that it was higher on Don than Kuban. Particularly, it was concluded in little centralized and mass forming and the Cossack troops in Kuban. Making advances to Cossacks, the German leadership began the reconstruction of the Cossack autonomies with district and village government in Cossack lands. Moreover, the autonomous Cossack district was created in the northwest of Kuban. It included six areas of Krasnodar region with a population of about uh, 160,000 people. In December 1942, under the Ministry of the Affairs of Eastern Occupied Territories, it was being created the Cossack administration of Don Kuban and Terek, headed by Nikolai Himpel. One of the aims of this administration was the preparing of organization of interim Cossack government abroad, which was created in spring 1944 in format of the main control of Cossack forces headed by Piotr Krasnov. One of the main evidence of the difficult position of the Third Reich and its change of attitude to the Cossacks became the declaration of the 10th of November 1943, signed by the chief of staff of German High Command, Command Wilhelm Keitel, and Imperial Minister of the Eastern Province, Alfred Rosenberg. Cossacks were declared as fightful companions and allies of German army. They were given with several rights and privileges. In case of impossibility of living in homeland, the German government promised to Cossacks to set the Cossack life in the east of Europe under the protection of Führer, providing them with all this was necessary. In spring 1943, near the town Mlava, Poland, it was started the forming of the first large regular military unit considered entirely of Cossacks under command of German colonel Helmut von Panwitz, soon became major general, the first Cossack cavalry division. It included the Cossack regiment headed by Wolf, Thompson, Young Schulz and division of Kononov. All command posts in the division were taken by Germans. The expression was Ivan Kononov, who headed the 5th Don Cossack regiment. Making advance into Cossacks was mainly connected with the sharp downgrade of Germany army in the Eastern Front and with started retreat of Hitler forces. The occupants' retreat caused also living Kamland by a certain number of local population. A especially large percentage of outgoings was among the Cossacks, largest compared with the other population, but all in all the number of left was incomparably less than who stayed. Another exodus of Cossacks became the new tragic page in their history. The main reasons for that were the first of new repressions caused by the collaboration with Nazi during the occupation and unwillingness to live in the country where the government for more than 20 years had been grinding the Cossacks like high-powered grinders of dead-hearted mission. Many of them were living, uh, were living with families because they clearly realized what waited for the relatives of those who had left for enemy. They also understood that instead of the immigration of 1920, they were living forever and there would not be any way back. In the end of November 1943, in order to unite all Cossacks going west, it was created the so-called Cossack Stan, special organization of the Cossacks, headed by the combat ataman Sergei Pavlov. All Cossacks and Cossack troops situating on the occupied territory should have been joined this organization. According to the declaration of German government of the 10th of November 1943, the Cossacks were provided with territory in Kamenets Podolsk province. Sergei Pavlov was instructed to organize the placement and existence of Cossack villages and organization and maintenance of Cossack troops. 
In spring 1944, the Kozak Stan was subordinated to the main control of Kozak forces headed by General Pyotr Krasnov. The Kozak stayed in Kamenets Podolsk province for less than half a year. The harsh assault of the Soviet army forced Kozaks to continue the retreat to the west. The new place of Kozak placement was Belarusia. As it is now, Belarusia during the World War II was one of the places where the partisan movement had become widespread. widespread. Thus, it was said not only about number and quantity of partisan troops, but also about their increased activity. Most likely, it was one of the reasons for the fact that this territory was given for settlement to Cossacks. Trying to assure peaceful existing Cossacks had to wage an active fight against partisans. And considering mutual dislike of partisans and Cossacks, it could be expected one hard and unmerciful fight. The Cossacks' troops soon could move partisans from some part of the territory and bring it under the control and security lines of the communications. In July 1944, when the threat of and so Clement appeared, Cossacks began wedding to Poland from Belarusia. One of the Cossack regiments took part in the suppression of Warsaw Rebellion in Poland. In August 1944, the German leadership decided to move the Cossackstan and the Cossacks troops to northern Italy, Friuli area. It seemed one of the reasons for such step was the aim of the German command to provide the like in Belarus some kind of order by forces of Cossacks. Northern Italy, like Belarus, was flooded with partisans what was considerably caused by the local natural conditions. There are forests in Belarus and mountains in northern Italy. This territory was strategically important for the German command because it, pro it provided some connection between Balkans and Central Europe and was situated on the way of British-American forces carrying forward from the south of the Apennine Peninsula. Here, here is northern Italy. It took place some certain reunion of Cossacks who had emigrated in 1920 with Cossacks who left Russia with the returning Nazi Nazi Amis. On the 7th of September 1944, it was assured the order of General Piotr Krasnov, the head of the main control of Cossack forces, about the forming of the Cossack Corps and the tasks of the Cossack Stan. On the 55 February 1945, the 1st Cossack Cavalry Division was officially turned into the 15th Cavalry Corps of SS troops. The total number of the corps was about 25,000 people. Practically from the moment of its creation, Cossacks of the 15th Corps has to keep brutal fights, predominantly restraining the onrush of the National Liberation Army of Yugoslavian and Bulgarian forces. Under the pressure of exceeding enemy forces in May, in May 1945, the decision was taken to retreat to Austria, which became a certain place of gathering Cossacks. Here, not only the Cossack stan was directed, but also the Cossack troops of the Russian Corps and Cossack emigrants who had been scattered along the territory of the Third Reich and its hundred states. Almost all Cossacks, the Cossack stan, the 15th Cossack Corps, and other Cossack troops capitulated to British forces and were placed in Lienz area. Subsequently, most Cossacks were extradited to the USSR. However, the great amount of them died in camps and just a few cold returned to their homeland or go abroad. Thus, from the 20,000 Cossacks from the Kazakhstan extradited by the British, only uh, 2,000 people survived in camps and waited for their liberation in 1955-1956. The research of the Cossack participation in the World War II begets a number of issues and problems. First of all, still it is not determined the number of Cossack collaborations. It is closely connected with another methodological problem, whom can we treat as collaborationist? collaborationist. It seems not to be connect, concerned Cossack emigrants to the collaborationists since they had never been citizens of the USSR. 
In conclusion, I would like to notice that the Cossack collaboration with the Nazi Germany was defined from both sides as by objective reasons and just be constructed. All in all, it should be stated that fact that problem of Cossack collaborationism requires the further deep and comprehensive analysis. Thank you for your attention, and excuse me, my English. Thank you, Dr. Ratushniak. Thank you. The first part of the presentation will analyze the position of the Roma in the period between the two world wars and the impact of prejudices and stereotypes toward the Roma and, uh, on the non-Romani population and Croatian authorities. In the main part of the paper, I will analyze the cases where the non-Romani population participated in the persecution of Roma. These cases involve the participation of the non-Romani population in looting Roma properties, organizing and carrying out deportation uh, to the concentration camps, especially to Yasenovac, as well as the killing and torture of the Roma. Cases in which non-Roma population defended the Roma and tried to save them from the persecution by the Ustash authorities will be analyzed after that. Something about history of the Roma in Croatia. Settlements of Roma in the Europe took place in several waves in the context of political and social protests on the territory of Europe and the Middle East. As a part of this southeastern European settlement wave, the Roma settled in Croatian lands in the 14th century. Roman mentioned in Dubrovnik and Zagreb in that time, and some researchers associate the arrival of Roma in Croatia with the Ottoman conquest after that, when a group of Roma followed the, their army. Changing perception and attitude toward the Roma in some European country also reflected uh, on the Croatian authorities in the 16th century who followed the example of the most European authorities. Such negative attitudes towards the Roma transferred into legal regulation of their position in the Croatian society. The military advances of the Habsburg M uh, army in southeastern Europe in the 18th century opened up the question of regulation of the local Romani population. Especially Maria Theresa and Joseph II issued a number of important legal provisions on the Roma in the period from 1749 to 1783, which sought to assimilate them and thus integrate them into the Habsburg state. This also reflected in the creation lands. In the middle of the 19th century, a large group of Romanian Roma had, after the abolition of slavery, in the Romanian lands uh, in the mid-19th century settled on Croatian territory. They differed from uh, other Roma because they were part of the Vlach Roma and they spoke uh, uh, with uh, old Romani language, Limba Bayash. Croatian authorities continued with the legal regulation of the gypsy question with the aim of stopping especially nomadic, black, foreign Roma groups uh, into the Croatian lands. The Romanian population in uh, Croatia, together with the rest of the population, became part of the new Yugoslav state after 1918, after the First World War. According to the official population census, the number of Roma in interwar Yugoslavia was around 70,000. 15,000 of that was the Roma in Croatian land. Mostly in the eastern, you will see, uh, that uh, there was mostly in the e eastern and uh, uh, western and um, uh, parts of the Croatia. They were mostly young people, Roman Catholic or the Orthodox religion, and mostly illiterate. Official Croatian authorities didn't acknowledge them as official national minorities or protect their minorities' rights. The suffering Roma of the Second World War and the beginning, uh, I would uh, just want to say that the German Nazi policy in the 1930s included the persecution of Roma population, which can be considered a form of anti ziganist or anti gypsies uh, policy. In the World War II era Europe, the Roma were one of the first victims of the war, and what uh, followed could be described with, uh, with by the terms of Pariamus, or some historians uh, say some of the Radipen 
term related in contrast to Holocaust in Jewish context. The establishment of the pro-fascist uh, Ustasha government in Croatia in April 1941 quickly led to the abduction of Nazi anti-Ziganist or anti-Gypsy model in dealing with the Roma minority. The enhancement of this uh, legal uh, regulation was to set the groundworks for the persecution of the Roma. Thus, on the uh, 30 April 1941, the Ustasha authorities entailed the legislative provision on racial affiliation and the other provision, legislative provision on the protection of Aryan blood and the honor of the Croatian people. In order to realize, uh, realize this legislative provision, it was necessary to, derm uh, to determine uh, their racial affinity, and uh, for this reason the authorities drew up the instruction for composing uh, uh, a declaration of uh, racial affinity. On grounds of this instruction, the Ministry of Interior uh, um, and taste on the uh, beginning of July 1941 the decision to conduct the obligatory census of the Roma. The first mass killing of the Roma uh, in the independent state of Croatia happened in the broader context of liquidation of the Serb population. Especially uh, the, the, this case was uh, on the last, uh, uh, last day of July 1941 in Ivanić Jarak near Karlovac region and continued uh, on uh, 1st January 1942 when 74 Roma killed in a village Desno Sredičko, also in the vicinity of uh, Karlovac. The next action of the Ustasha authorities regarding the Roma concerned the question of their colonization. The newly formed Institute for Colonization examined this possibility in summer 1941, especially since their colonization, they saw that will solve their problematic status, especially so-called criminality amongst Roma. More extensive and organized persecution of Roma in the independent state of uh, Croatia begin with the circular of the Ministry of Interior and the decree of Ustasha Supervisor Service in May 1942 on the rounding up of all Roma. Master, the, master arrest and removal of Roma occurred from the May 1942 until the July of the, uh, the same year, and their ultimate goal was to deport all Roma in the Yasenovac camp. A number of Roma were uh, liquidated immediately upon arrival to the camp, while other Roma were initially settled in the vacated Serbian house in the village of Ustice. This is the part uh, today of Jasenovac camp memorial site. It is believed that there were no Roma after July 1942, and some Roma grave diggers uh, uh, were uh, killed at the beginning of 1945, and this was uh, the rest of the Roma in Yesenovac's uh, camp. The views, uh, views and the relationship of non-Roma towards Roma. The population of uh, independent states of the Croatia in April 1941 experienced experienced the newly formed state in a different way. Part of population were aesthetic, considering to be an expression of the freedom after century of servitude under foreign states and people, or because they believed that uh, the war uh, uh, avoided through its creation. The other part of population was afraid for their status under the new country. The state authorities soon adopted the terror as a means of the consolidation of their power, and the Roma were amongst the victims of this, I will call, system of terror. Cases of Roma prosecution. The negative perception of Roma as parasites and useless people was present in Croatian society, especially in the media. For example, in February 1942, uh, I would say a um, famous Croatian journalist, Branko, and uh, literally uh, author Branko Markulin, in the magazine of Family, described the Roma as, as the scum of the society. 
hardened criminals, swindlers and cruel kidnappers and abusers of non-Romani children. The Croatian authorities themselves often stress in various reports that the Roma were the shabbiest parts of the Croatian society. At the same time, the German authorities believed that the gypsy, case, uh, gypsy problem was not so urgent to be resolved in the Croatia. The policies of the Ustash authority towards the Roma are reflected in one of the in anonymous author introductionally article from the Varaždin newspaper called Hrvatsko jedinstvo, several weeks after the establishment of the independent states of Croatia in April 1941, where they clearly indicated three ethnic groups as the main socio-political problem for the Croatian government. Aside from the Serbs, who is called a dangerous and deadly adder, and Jews, who is called parasites or pests, the Roma were highlighted as the third group and uh, were to be removed from the Croatian society, especially from the Croatian villages. The already existing negative perception of Roma in Croatian society was strengthened in the Ustasha Croatia, which was to remove uh, Roma as an ulcer, quote, on the healthy Croatian society. Several months after the establishment of the independent state of Croatia, the state and local authorities initiated repressive actions against the Roma population. The systematic terror of the Roma was not conducted uh, by the authorities alone, but with, also with help of the local population. The fact that the member of German national minority organization, Mirna Jadjasov, about Kulturbund, uh, participated in the Ustasha uh, deportation and plundering in the areas, I, I, I analyze the cases in the areas of Alpova and Virovitica, this is the eastern Croatia, offers a few proof of this. However, it was not only that the German population participated in the persecution of Roma. Most of the population uh, was, uh, who participated in these cases were the members of majority creation population, especially, for example, local hunters uh, led by Ustasha uh, functionaries uh, participate in the so-called village cleaning action. Uh, some villagers were mobilized to transport Roma to the camps. Uh, creation also, villagers participated in the public auction of the seized Roma property. You will see uh, these action records of such of the, the, this kind of uh, auction in the Slavonia region in uh, September uh, 1942. Um, I say that uh, Croatian villagers participated in the public auction to be uh, to the of the seas Roma property in the eastern Slavonia and Varaždin in the region. Croatian villagers bought household items such as tables, cupboards, beds, bed sheets, and various tools, especially like from uh, uh, for Roma blacksmith's tools and so on. On uh, on this action, similar theft of the Romani prop, uh, property happened uh, during their de deportation to the Asenovac camp, and the looting of the Romani pro uh, property also applied to their land, which was nat na nationalized when they deported uh, to the camps, which meant that state become their owner and control their property. Cases of saving Roma. There exist a few studies that analyze the relationship of the population towards the Roma in the independent states of Croatia, but some historians mention that a part of the population actively try to save their Serb, Jewish, or uh, Romani compatriots from the repressive police uh, of the Ustasha state on individual or group level. Such a case has been recorded in the Koprivnica region where the inhabitants sent letters with pleas and statements where they ask for the certain prisoners to be released, certain Roma prisoners to be released from the Danica uh, uh, concentration camp. A number of non-Romani persons could not stand idly by, uh, by and publicly show compassion toward their Romani neighbors. It is likely that uh, those among the non-Romani population who empathize with the Roma 
ask themselves how could they help. One of the successful examples of saving Roma was uh, recorded in the Podravina region when uh, uh, Jakob Pirjavet, who was the commander of the uh, gendarmerie station in the Sokolovac municipality, uh, this is a municipality near Koprivnica, refused to carry out the orders from June 1941 to arrest the local Roma and deport them to the Danica camp. And that uh, allowed them to survive the war. A year later, the municipality authorities in Verpolje, who following pleased and managed to rescue around 10 Romas, long-time residents, and especially emphasized that they were good uh, Catholics. Uh, also, there existed an initiative for the saving Roma from deportation among the villagers of Kutjevo. Namely, in the mid-1942, 44 Roma were arrested and turned over to the Ustasha in uh, Slavonska Požega city, while their property was given for keeping to the municipality authorities, while they were only allowed to take the barest essential and clothing and food with them. Then some of the Kutjevo villagers unsuccessfully tried to petition uh, for their Romani neighbor, noting, uh, noting uh, that uh, they were peaceful and hardworking people and were those to be exempt from the deportation. The inhabitants also, another case, the inhabitants of small village of Gunja, this is um, villages near the Bosnia Herzegovina, uh, uh, Gunja strove to save their uh, Romani neighbors from the deportation trains by claiming that they were their relatives or by writing to the state authorities in Zagreb that the Gunja Roma was the honest and diligent people and that uh, they must be accept, uh, accept of them and to be released from the concentration camp. However, a part of the population cooperated with the church authorities and organizing protection for a part of Roma population in the independent states of Croatia. Uh, some uh, also mentioned that the intervention of Croatian Muslim society from Zagreb and Muslim uh, authorities from uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, in the May 1941 had an important role in the protecting this Roma. They attempt to prove that Muslim Roma, or so-called white Roma, good Roma, uh, domestic Roma, uh, were completely assimilated and Croatized. On the grounds of this, the Ministry of Interior decided on the 30th of August 1941 to exclude this Roma from deportation to the camps. It is apparent uh, from the mentioned cases that the religion of Roma was of critical importance for their protection. Since this is a complex question, I do not wish to vary too far from the focus because I don't have much time. But I will mention but only one example of this complexity. Anton Medved, who, is, uh, who was a Roman Catholic priest and scholar, the, uh, distinguished himself as one of those who promoted the better understanding of Romani population before, during, and after the Second World War. Uh, he ministered in several parishes until 1918, and after 1980, he became a priest in Križ. This is a small village uh, near Zagreb. Uh, and he spent, uh, uh, with the proclamation of the independent states of uh, Croatia, he spent three months holding the office of Ustasha Tabernik. This, this was a low-ranking official in the municipality and spent the rest of the, uh, the war serving immediately as the head or deputy of the head of the municipality of Križ. The post-war government, Yugoslav government, arrested him and several months after the end of the war sentenced him to 20 years in prison on, a, uh, on an accusation that he participated in the Ustasha government in Križ. He served his sentence in, in camps uh, Stara Gradiška and uh, Velika Pisanica, but was soon released uh, uh, from the prison near the end of 1946. 
The reason for his early release can be traced to the appeals from his uh, uh, parishioners and the family members who write to the military authorities. It is especially, uh, I, I want to emphasize that, uh, that the members of uh, communistic authorities after the Second World War was one of these uh, people who petitioned for Medvin to be released because, according to him, he was one of the critical persons who saved not only the Roma but the Jewish and, and the Serb minority in this region. Also, I must uh, emphasize that uh, the Medvin distinguished himself most of all as a Roman Catholic priest in Croatia who performed the first Roman Catholic Mass in the Romani language in April 94 in Odra. He is near Velka Gorica. Velka Gorica is near uh, Zagreb. According to some, around 800 people, mostly of local farmers, attended this Mass. You will see these pictures of, uh, I will know, um, in, in the middle is the priest uh, Anton Menmet surrounding uh, uh, the Roma. It is, it is estimated that about 800 Roma attended this first Mass on the Roma language. From the conclusion, In the chaos that ensued after the outbreak of the World War II, the Roma were one of the undesirable parts of the society whose leaders strove to create a racially pure, na pure nation. The Roma began as the last free men, as the Croatian writer Ivan Goran Kovacic called them on the eve of the war, and were pre pre persecuted because of their freedom, because of their way of life, culture, tradition, language, and history. In conducting their violent, repressive policy toward the Roma, the government relied, relied on the support of the part of the population which participated in the persecution of Roma, especially in the looting of their property and the deportation and murder of them. At the same time, a part of the population strove to help the Roma. The aid most concerned save, uh, saving the Roma from the deportation to the camps, where most of them were killed or uh, tortured. The part of the population claimed that the Roma were good and useful members of society, but this uh, went against the racial policy of the Ustasha government and the dominant, very negative perception of the Roma as uh, criminals and asocial people. The Bosnian Herzegovina Muslim secular and religious representative went the farthest in this effort and managed. <coughs> excuse me and managed to prove that Muslim Roma, so-called white Roma, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, were, as evidenced by their behavior and other actions, no longer Roma, but good creations and good, uh, uh, good uh, population of Muslim faith. The case of the Roman Catholic priest Medven suggests a complex relationship between the church and the local authorities toward the Roma, which should be further investigated and analyzed. Thankfully, the attempts to exterminate the Roma in Croatia was not successful, and it is uh, possible that this was in part due to the human examples of their saying by non-Roma population during the war. Thank you for your attention. So now we made up some time for discussion, and we have as far as I see, about 20 minutes of discussion. So I ask you to keep your questions or comments precise and short, and please introduce yourself before you speak. The gentleman in front. Karl Pfeiffer, journalist. My question is to Mr. Voyak. Uh, <clears throat> what, was the, what was the attitude of the Catholic clergy of Cardinal Stepinac to the fact that his people, the Romanis, where most of them were Catholics, were deported to death. Did he say something? Did the Catholic Church say something about this after 45, if they did not before 45? 
this is very complex questions and I don't have a time to analyze the, this complexity but I will also point it out that during the Second World War you will see Stepinets uh, as um, for me negative and positive figure negative figure especially at the beginning of the war when uh, he accepted the, the new uh, Ustasha authorities and accepted w what happened there um, I would say uh, atrocity especially amongst the Serbians and uh, Jewish population and then the Roma. You will see in uh, one of the mass that uh, Stepinac hold in uh, I think summer 1943 when they uh, when he called that this is the barbarity of the Ustasha authorities that they killed the Jewish Jewish, they killed Roma, all people are the, are the same. For me, when I, uh, when I say complexity, you will see that most, uh, one part of the Roman Catholic were the murderers, were the torturers in the Yasenovac camp and in other camps in the independent states of Croatia. But some examples, especially as a Medvin, was the priest who tried to save Roma. For me, it, it is not the, the, the simple answer. For me, it, it is on the individual case. After the Second World War, I, I, I don't have any information that the Roman Catholic Church in Croatia has uh, attempted to, I will say, clarify their position the word persecution, especially by the Roma, after the Second World War. My, 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 my simple uh, answer is this is a very complex question, and we must analyze it on the individual case, not in group case. You will see torturers, uh, Bosnian priests, and Herzegovina priests in the Asenovas camp, you will see in other parts, also you will see example of the Medvin who tried to save. Thank you, Alexander Korb. Um, Alexander Korb, Wiesenthal Institute. I have a question for Mir Nazakic. And uh, when I studied um, ethnic minorities in Yugoslavia and um, well, violent conflicts between them and identity politics, I was always struck by the fact that uh, the boundaries between them are actually very gray and, and blurred and sometimes it's really impossible to tell what's an ethnic German and what's a Serb and they sometimes didn't know and they could re-register um, many ethnic Germans didn't speak German at all um, and uh, let me give you one brief example when uh, this SS division uh, Prince Eugen was deployed to Croatia in the eyes of the Croats, that was actually not a German division, but they were seen as Serbs, and they were um, frustrated by the fact that the Germans are sending a Serbian militia into Croatia. So my question is, um, looking at the press, does that not actually uh, sometimes hide the reality, which is much more complicated, and um, is the value of, of, the, of the press um, therefore not to be well, touched with caution? Well, first to address the issue of the porous boundaries between the ethnic groups, of course, they are not so much porous as they barely exist. My favorite example is the um, first and last name of the Volksgruppen Führer in Serbia Banat, who was called Josef Janko. Janko is a very typical Serbian name, usually a first name, not a last name, but still. It indicates that uh, over 200 years there was a lot of intermarriage, if nothing else. A lot of bilingualism or multilingualism. Uh, many folks, Deutsche, in the late Habsburg period became partially assimilated into the Magyar nation and spoke Hungarian better than German, then kind of rediscovered their Germanness in interwar Yugoslavia because it was preferable to be German than Hungarian due to Hungarian irredentism. So, of course, this is a, 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 identity politics are a complex issue. However, I will point out that during the occupation period, the folks group, so the organized ethnic German minority in Serbia and the Banat, imposed restrictions on, on um, who could register as a member of the folks group. So very often there was a kind of trial wait period to see how German this person was or rather how they behaved. 
Did they contribute to German charities? Were they willing to volunteer for the SS? Um, did they send their child to a German school? What kind of performative aspects of nationality. At a certain point, don't quote me on this, but I'm almost certain this is 1941, so right before the beginning of the Waffen-SS uh, mobilization, it became impossible for a person who has already been registered as an ethnic German to re-register into another nation. In other words, the ethnic German um, administration in the Banat flat and, and Belgrade, where the largest populations lived, flat out refused to allow those who already had their German ID cards to leave. So in other words, the war, as in many other parts of Europe, simplified issues of nationality by imposing these modern means of this is your identity, this is your pigeonhole, and by golly, you will stay there once you have been pigeonholed. As for the press, of course the Banata Belbachta is a typical example of the so-called controlled press. So it does not reflect the opinions of various ethnic Germans who naturally complained and had their own ideas about what national socialism should be and why doesn't the, our leadership listen to my personal needs, the usual things, right? Mekirai, or, 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 or as, as, as the wonderful term goes, quetching. I love that word. Um, but at the same time, the ethnic German press did convey the opinion of the leaders. And for better and for worse, the leaders were the ones who spoke for everybody. So even if many Waffen-SS recruits were not happy about being recruited, especially those who were already in their 50s and had maybe served in World War I and thought they had paid their dues, nobody could listen to them. The only, um, the only means of having one's voice heard in this ethnic German community was to talk like a Nazi, whether one wanted to or not. So I find the use, the study of propaganda useful from the perspective of what was the official discourse. Of course, it doesn't reflect what people thought, but, you know, don't take this the wrong way, but their personal opinions really didn't matter in the grand scheme of things. The official, kind of the official party line was what mattered. So. Thank you. The lady in the third row. Um, Francesca Exler from the European University Institute in Florence. I have a question about ideology, violence, and individual motives or motivation. Um, I study Belarusia. <laughs> I study Belarusia, and as mentioned, that was sort of the one of the main places of um, Soviet partisan warfare against the Germans, which in this region very much resembled or took the form of a civil war because locals. Um, were involved on both um, sides. And it seems to me that a lot of the violence that locals commit in this um, partisan warfare in the name of German power has very little to do with ideology and sort of often defies clear-cut sort of categorization of when we talk about motivations um, for that. So I'm sort of wondering... Um, um, sorry, and so then if we talk about the question of local complicity at this conference, it's also you know, not always easy, I think, to say exactly why people acted a certain way. So I was wondering, Myrna if, you could, Myrna, if you could talk a little bit more about whether you see that applying in your case as well. Is there sort of local involvement beyond the SS unit in the fight against partisans, and what do you see as sort of motivations there? And then, Aliak, the question would also be, when you talk especially about Cossacks who were mobilized from the prison of war camps, um, how do you, what, what sort of, what are your sources at looking at their motivations and what, what do you say about, um, you know, when they're then later unemployed in Belarus and the fight against partisans, how do you see the relationship between ideology and individual motives? Thank you for your questions. Unfortunately, my English is not well and my son will help me with translation, okay? Thank you for your question one more time. Uh, Uh, so uh, the harsh and uh, very uh, unmerciful uh, fight of the Cossacks against partisans uh, was not uh, an ideological aspect. Uh, they just um, protected uh, their camps because uh, when they were going west uh, with the retreating German armies, uh, they were going there with their families, with their relatives, and so uh, they were just protecting themselves and their families. So it was uh, not some kind of uh, ideology which was uh, brought in their minds. So this is all. Uh, 
could you elaborate on the sources for the motivation? Uh, when we're when we're talking about the sources of motivation, uh, we are talking about uh, Cossacks emigrants or Cossacks who were citizens of the USSR and whom we can uh, call collaborationists, whom of them? Both. Uh, so, uh, in both cases, uh, it was uh, a negative uh, attitude uh, to the Soviet regime, to the Bolsheviks regime. Uh, the second aspect is, uh, co was concluded in that, uh, that the Cossacks uh, saw uh, in this uh, war uh, the, uh, uh, the continuing of the uh, civil war in Russia. Uh, among uh, them, there were uh, Soviet uh, captives, Soviet prisoners of war, who wanted to save their lives, to protect themselves. And also among the immigrants, it was just uh, some kind of uh, opportunity to earn some money. So these are the main reasons uh, of, and the main sources of motivation, uh, but uh, uh, of course there are uh, much more of them. Thank you. Uh, for the motivations of the Waffen-SS recruits in Prince Eugen, the tricky thing, of course, is that when the recruits speak in the record, they usually speak in their post-war testimonies, which in my experience are surprisingly straightforward. There is very little open lying or sort of evading of responsibility or whitewashing or they uh, speak in the handful of letters I've been able to find asking to be released from Waffen-SS um, Waffen duty. In other words, they complain. I am too old. I have already served in World War I. There's nobody to bring in my harvest. My, son, my children are too young. My wife is alone, etc., etc., etc. Nobody ever wants to serve in the army, right? I mean, nobody ever wants to be mobilized into an armed force. In other words, this is not unusual. One sees the same kind of attitude of trying to dodge military service in other German Soviet and other formations as, as well. Not very many people were actually released, and when they were, um, immediately upon return to the Banat, they were usually uh, roped into one or the other police or militia force uh, at home. In other words, they were going to do some kind of military service one way or the other. In other words, um, the idea that this propaganda turned a lot of people into enthusiastic soldiers for Hitler, not so much, but I think it helped. I mean, people like Jürgen Förster have uh, studied um, ideological training of the Waffen-SS, the lectures, the literature, which taught reluctant recruits how to think like good soldiers for the Nazi cause. There is also the fact that in um, Southeast Europe, especially in the independent state of Croatia, the Waffen-SS was often the not very good, but still the most reliable fighting force the Germans could count on because, and I quote from a, a German memo from 1944, the Ustasche are only useful for persecuting Serbs and the Croatian army is not much better and the German forces are too few. In other words, the Waffen-SS was often the only available um, uh, man pool of armed force but they had to cover enormous distances they had to deal with uh, a resistance movement which they usually could not, could not distinguish from the civilian population and very often there was no difference. The civilian they, they were civilians by day and partisans by night sometimes. So the application of excessive brutality basically became the only means of conducting anti-partisan warfare. I'm not trying to boil this down to some kind of uh, exculpatory remark about, oh, it's the dynamics of warfare. Not at all. I'm simply saying that once one starts to think about all of these people, right, that one is faced with as potentially an enemy, and there is this sense of they are all after us. We have to be brutal, we have to be violent. There is a certain logical course to how things happen. So, so I have now a th a three further questions. Uh, since we are a little bit short of time, I would uh, like to ask you to ask the questions in a row. We collect them and have a final round then. The lady in the first row. 
Thank you very much, Andrea Petu, Central European University. Thank you very much for these very rich descriptive papers. And I would like to invite you to comment on the recent literature about um, uh, uh, a new trend in looking at the Holocaust. And I would like to join Mr. Shapiro's comment uh, when he was uh, uh, asking us to think about general patterns. Uh, and not to get lost in case studies and not to get lost in this structure agency discussion. And my question is related to this new, uh, not that new, like um, recently discussing uh, uh, Holocaust as a part of the European colonial project and uh, uh, as its cruelest form. And uh, I would like to ask you, what do you think about this uh, kind of uh, literature, which is thinking about uh, managing, controlling uh, the different differences, uh, and what are the uh, kind of continuities with the European legacy, colonial legacy, and uh, are there similarities, are there differences? Can we learn anything from the adaptation of those particular technologies of power which had been applied in these very interesting case studies, or this is a far-fetched comparison? Thank you. Um, thank you. This is a broad subject. We might have another panel on that, but I answer Paul Shapiro. What is question? Uh, this is a question for Dr. Ratushniak. You provided many rationales for Cossack alliance and support of Nazi Germany militarily. I wonder if you could tell us something about the attitudes of those participants, Cossack participants, toward the mass murder of Jews and their participation in the mass murder of Jews, maybe perhaps because you talked about their protection of their own families. Uh, if you could tell us about that part of the Cossack experience. Yeah, and there was the gentleman over there. Uh, hi, Richard Espenshade, University of Illinois. Uh, my question is actually similar to Andrea's, uh, I, but specifically for Professor Zakic, I was struck by this sense of a civilizing mission on the part of the uh, Bonat uh, Germans that did seem to have a lot in common with uh, colonial situations, although obviously there are differences. They're agricultural workers. They've been living as a minority. It's a different ideological context. But, uh, I mean, the question was the same as Andrea's, I guess, uh, how useful do you find the literature on uh, colonialism and more broadly, what might the study of collaboration and uh, the Holocaust benefit from uh, in an intersection with literature on colonialism? So thank you. Uh, I would now ask Dr. Ratushniak to answer his question and then we will follow. Thank you for your question. Uh, so uh, there was um, a kind of thought uh, in the Cossacks' minds uh, because they saw in uh, Jewish people uh, one uh, of the main reasons uh, for the uh, Great October Revolution in 1917 in Russia. Uh, but uh, if we... Uh, if we uh, talk about uh, their participants in uh, annihilation, in uh, killing Jews, uh, when uh, Cossacks were going west uh, with the retreating German armies, uh, on those territories uh, almost all Jewish population uh, was already uh, killed or uh, brought to the concentration camps. Uh, but uh, on the uh, traditional Cossack territories, uh, sometimes uh, Cossacks uh, take, uh, took part in uh, killing Jewish people, uh, like uh, members of Zonderkommands uh, or like special police forces. Uh, but uh, all in all, uh, their uh, whole activity uh, uh, was, wasn't uh, directed uh, against Jews and uh, on killing them. And there were also uh, cases uh, that uh, among Cossacks uh, there were people 
people uh, with a uh, confession of Judaism. So they weren't only Orthodox Christians, Christians, but in, uh, sometimes Judaism. Uh, but uh, little people uh, know about it. Thank you. Thank you. So I would now uh, ask Dr. Zakic and Dr. Vujak to comment in brief about the colonial concept. Uh. I find the literature on colonialism uh, as the Nazi, on the Nazi project in Eastern Europe as a kind of colonial project. I'm going to emphasize a kind of, because uh, frankly I deal with um, American undergraduates for whom it's all one thing, and I have to work really hard to get them to understand that the Belgian Congo was not a lovely place, but it's, diff but it's not lovely in a different way than Nazi-occupied Poland. So I think it's a literature that has a lot to offer, but I also think it's a literature that has more to offer to people who study um, Poland and the Soviet Union under Nazi occupation than to people who study Southeast Europe. And here is why. Because Southeast Europe was not Lebensraum. Sure, they kind of called it Lebensraum because they conveniently had these ethnic Germans that they could exploit and use to their own purposes, but there was no grand idea that Hungary and Romania and Yugoslavia will be places which, uh, which the Nazis will transform into a Germanic paradise of Autobahn and, and armed peasants and whatnot. There was none of that. If anything, the party line until the end of the war was these ethnic Germans in Southeast Europe are useful for military, agricultural, and ideological purposes, but after a German victory, we resettle all of them into the East. So there wasn't this idea that, you know, Northern Yugoslavia was going to become a place where Germans will flock for a vacation, the way they thought about Crimea. So it's, it, I, I find the, the colonial paradigm of limited use in, in Southeast Europe. It's, it's, it's interesting, but for, uh, for my personal purposes, not very useful. Mm -hmm. uh, to connect the question about uh, how do you move beyond case studies, look, I love case studies. I'm a historian. I do not like to predict the future, and I do not like, I imagine, as many people in this room, um, I like my little fiefdom. But at the same time, I think uh, studying ethnic Germans um, says a lot about just how ambivalent German national identity remained all through the Nazi period, in spite of how hard the Nazis worked to make it seem like this monolithic, solid, pers uh, persuasive thing. At the same time, what I've read in the secondary literature which is not very abundant, um, on ethnic Germans in other parts of Europe. I do find that the Serbian Banat was a kind of unique case for the simple reason that, and I'm going to make a bold statement now, I'm being bold. Um, in no other part of the German sphere of influence does one find an ethnic German minority which was given as much leeway and as much executive power in its native region as the Serbian Banat Germans. Sure, police forces and Waffen SS and peasants, that's all fine and well, but an ethnic German administration which basically had the, run, the daily running of their home region, one doesn't see that in the Ukraine, one doesn't see that in Poland, one does not see even this modicum of trust placed in an ethnic German population by the Nazis is from the Third Reich. So it's, a, it's kind of betwixt and between. It's a unique case, but it's also one that fits into this general pattern of the, the fuzziness of Germanness. Mm -hmm. When we talk about case study, when we talk about Roma, uh, yesterday my colleague pointed out very well, uh, Roma are unique in uh, analyzing in the research because you will see in, I will say in lands of former Yugoslavia, from Slovenia to Macedonia, most of different cases, different cases of settled Roma, of nomadic Roma, or well-integrated, I would say, assimilated Roma, non-assimilated Roma, and so on. Um, what is our purpose or our chance as a researcher? Uh, for me, uh, when analyzing the period, Second World War, and suffering Roma in that period. My chance is first to compare the Roma in the lands they, they, they had lived just before the Second World War. This is the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. But you will see a lot of nomadic groups of Roma who, um, who approaches from the Hungary, who approaches from Bulgaria, and so on, and influence the, the Roma custom of living, and so on. Maybe, maybe in connection to my colleagues in Hungary, especially in Romania, to have a um, chance to 
do uh, do most important, um, I would say, large research base, and to compare these case studies as one of the examples, uh, and maybe maybe to have. A, to have discussion of the similarity of differences, maybe, but I, I, I must point out uh, when you approach uh, the Roma, every um, Roma people uh, had uh, their own history. Um, history of the custom, language, influence from the, I would say, from the Slovenia, from the Macedonia, from the Bosnian. Similar the cases in uh, Hungary, probably similar case in Romania. Thank you very much. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to the discussants. We will have now a longer lunch break until 2 o'clock and I uh, ask you to be here at 2 p.m. straight so we can continue this afternoon. Thank you.